The way I really like to define restorative practices, especially within the school setting, is really moving away from looking at the rule that was broken and the consequence that should follow and shifting our mindset to the relationship that was harmed and how we repair it. Restorative practices is really two things. It's about building relationships and then repairing harm when harm is done. I've been a educator for 17 years about here in Albuquerque and what I was finding was you know, it was very punitive, a lot of suspending kids, detention, that sort of thing, and behaviors weren't changing. So I had the opportunity to learn about restorative practices as an administrator. In the past, uh, I've worked at Albuquerque Public Schools doing restorative practices, and that's where Erin and I met. So this work has been really important to us. And then when I came over to UNM, it was really important for me to carry on that connection. Middle school is just hour by hour, minute by minute. You don't know what is going to come up. So I do a lot of mediation, so a lot of kind of proactive work in preventing conflict. But the focus really is circles because that is the practice that we use to really build the foundation that we can then repair harm when it's caused on. When we start them out, it might be something as simple as if you had a superpower, what would it be? But as the year goes on, we get deeper and deeper so that we're building that trust and I thought it was really important for our teacher residents to have access to hearing directly from kids about restorative practices. So we started this work last year bringing in teacher residents and then Erin and I have just continued it and really kind of made it grow this year. It's really important for, for us and the work that we do to really broaden the toolbox for teachers and really take that different approach of supporting students rather than punishing. And really when we think about it, this is decarceral work. It really is trying to end that school to prison pipeline. And so really trying to keep kids in school, create those inclusive and safe environments. You are not really taught how to help kids solve these things, how to talk to kids about them. So I think it's really important that we are reaching out before teachers get into classrooms to kind of give them the tools and the time to practice it so that they can grow and feel more comfortable going into their own classrooms with them. What research says is that if a kid has one trusted adult, it increases their resiliency factors by so much. And so it was really important for me to make sure that I pass that on to future teachers. I always tell teachers the school to prison pipeline starts in the classroom, like you are the first person who decides to send them out, right? They get into a classroom where there are those challenging behaviors or students that have mental health needs and they don't know how to provide those supports. Both the teacher and the student are at a loss. The difference has been significant. We've definitely seen a huge drop in suspensions. Teachers are being a lot more aware and also just the amount of kids asking for help. We felt it was really important to make sure that the kids had an opportunity to speak to because who better to hear it from than the kids that are experiencing this? And, and we do this work for the kids and so when we're able to do it with them, we really wanted to showcase that. It was really important for us to have the kids have a say in a UNM classroom and really act as the faculty members. The kids get to experience the UNM campus and what better way to help our long-term recruitment for students in the state of New Mexico. It's amazing, you know, some of these kids have never been to UNM they've, or they've never seen anything other than like Pope Joy, right? To be able to walk them all around and show them the dorms and show them different classrooms and the libraries, like, it's very exciting. But we're able to talk to them too about like, you can do this, there's no reason why you can't do this. We were having some good experiences, you know, overwhelmingly positive experiences that they had and they really wanted to take these practices into their classrooms and we hope just to continue to strengthen that. I. I think once people participate, they actually realize that it's a much higher level of accountability for the person who calls harm. Because when you have to sit down face to face, right, with someone that you've harmed, to me that is much more difficult for us to do. I think one of the largest misconceptions about restorative practices is 
that we're being soft on kids. We're not holding kids accountable. And really when we slow things down and we do that deep work, we are actually really making a change and making efforts to hold kids accountable and make them aware of how their behaviors impact the larger community. So it really is about looking at the larger relational ecology of a school community and seeing how we are in relationship with each other, knowing that there's always going to be some breakdowns in those relationships. And then we have those tools to repair the relationships. When kids start to learn about each other, they have more respect for each other, they have more empathy for one another. So it really is a hopefully preventing conflict, but then also when the conflict occurs, if they have a relationship with that teacher, that other student, it's much easier for them to take accountability and want to repair the harm that they caused to that relationship. You know, as schools and teachers start to move towards this, they see the power in that, in the students being really at the forefront of making the change.